Hello and welcome guys, we're going to talk about hip dysplasia. Uh, it's a, obviously a condition we get a lot of questions about, people naturally have a concern about. I find I get a lot of questions about this, especially with our larger breed dogs, our purebred dogs. The ones that most of my clients are aware are predisposed to this condition. Okay, these are the German Shepherds, the Rottweilers, the Labradors, you know, those larger breed purebred dogs for whom this condition seems to be more common. So the first thing I want to do is basically show you a little model of the hips, kind of give you an idea what the heck hip dysplasia is. Well, it's part of the hip. Okay, we're talking about a hip joint issue. So when we're looking essentially at a dog's pelvis, um, first thing to do is basically get oriented. You know, you've got the pelvic bone itself. Okay, so the, it's a series of bones, but coming together as one solid structure. What we're looking at here is a problem in this area. It's the hip. Most of us recognize where a hip is and what it, what it means. It's basically the interaction between the head of the femur, okay, that's that ball and socket scenario, head of femur and acetabulum, which is essentially it's the seat in which the head of that femur sits. So something we're, we're kind of trying to explain to people when they come in with this question is, what have you been seeing? Now typically people are thinking, are you going to see specifically pain? Well, a lot of times you don't. My biggest observation clients will make in these younger dogs, it may not be obvious pain. It may be more of an unusual way of running. Some of these guys almost bunny hop, so they'll, the puppies in their, in their younger stages in a few months of age will be running and yet keeping their two back feet together, hopping together. They may also look sometimes as though they have a bit of a cow hocked stance, and that means their knee or their ankles look a little bit turned in. They kind of have this narrow look in the back. Sometimes they'll just basically be reluctant to use stairs or they may just have a general tendency not to use the back legs the way you would normally expect a dog to use those legs. But in the younger, younger age group, it can be really tough to tell if it's a, a, an obvious hip problem or if this is just a bumbling puppy. So it can be a real challenge and a lot of times you'll go into your vet and you'll have them say, take a look at it and see if there's any obvious signs of dysplasia. Now that sounds easy. The problem is trying to rein in a puppy for a vaccine, that's one thing. That's one thing harder than I give, that most people give credit for. The other is trying to essentially feel a hip in these guys to get a sense of if there's an abnormality there. And typically that process is going uh, to be one where your vet's gonna have a hard time doing it. It's a pretty hard thing to see on a routine exam. So if we have enough clinical concern, we're gonna to have to go through the, the, the steps necessary to really get a good look at that. So how do we go about the process of, of detecting a problem in the hips and, and ultimately ending up at our diagnosis of hip dysplasia? The process in puppies and old dogs alike is, is certainly gonna involve some type of general sedative to get the muscles surrounding the hip relaxed enough to allow uh, your veterinarian to feel for laxity. We call that laxity ortolani. Uh, that basically means we can feel the hip luxate or subluxate out of its acetabular uh, home uh, and, then, and kind of clunk back in. That right away is pretty much diagnostic uh, or pathic mnemonic for a dysplastic hip. That means there's just uh, too shallow of an acetabulum and ultimately a very loose um, ligament of the head of the femur. So it's allowing that movement to occur that order line to occur. Then we're going to need to take x-rays. Now in a young dog, a set of hip x-rays done in a routine way, which is kind of just to stretch those legs down, is not a way to really appreciate the laxity. The laxity in a young dog may only be clinical. They may not yet have any other changes that demonstrate that hip dysplasia. They might have some of these things, that shallow acetabulum that's not entrapping that femoral head, but that may, uh, they may also not have that at this stage. So it can be a real challenge. So what's recommended if you have enough clinical suspicion, maybe you're getting the Ortolani, you've got the dog who's bunny hopping, is to go through what's called a pen hip procedure. That procedure will give you the most sensitive um, and an objective, numerical uh, understanding of how much laxity is in those hips and can essentially provide us with that formal diagnosis of hip dysplasia and also give us a degree of how dysplastic those hips are. Only certain veterinarians have pen hip certification. It's not something any veterinarian can perform. 
you'll have to reach out to your vet for a referral if it's not something they're actively offering in their practice. All right, so we know we have hip dysplasia. What are we going to do about it? Well, the important thing to figure out is, were we planning to breed this guy? Or were we okay with having him as basically a house dog? First things first, if we have a dog with known hip dysplasia, we discourage breeding. We remove them from the breeding pool. We don't want this genetic trait to be passed along to their progeny. So we don't breed these guys. That's important. So if you have intentions to breed, most times we like to be able to prove that this, um, this breeding patient has been checked, given the pen hip okay, that the hips are good. That basically will help breeders to support the cost uh, that they, they impart upon the puppies that are later trying to, to sell. So from the standpoint of, of uh, them doing their due diligence, it's an important thing to consider. And obviously we don't, again, want to propagate a bad genetic problem. If this is going to be a house pup, now it comes down to what we're going to do for you. So if we find out you've got hip dysplasia, if we get you between 18 and 20 weeks of age, so we've seen those really early signs, maybe we had to do a sedated exam, did our pen hip, we have dysplasia, what are we going to do? Well, one thing that we can do in these very young dogs um, is we can do juvenile pubic symphysiodesis. How the heck does that work? Well, this process is basically involving, you make an incision in there, and there's a growth plate um, basically uh, com uh, attaching the pubic bones together. Now, what happens is ultimately that, that growth plate is destroyed using cautery, which is heat. That basically stops the growth of that particular growth plate. What that will do is create a relative um, turning over of the acetabulum due to the growth of the rest of the pelvis. So as the rest of the pelvis grows and that area does not, we get a natural kind of uh, overgrowth or um, overturning of those sockets and that naturally traps those uh, femoral, uh, femoral heads better. So they actually kind of get a natural cupping action that should keep that hip from naturally slipping out um, as its tendency is to do that with dysplasia. So that's a great procedure if they're young, but if they get older than about 20 weeks, they're not really a candidate. The growth plate's starting to close. Doing the surgery is unlikely to, to impart any benefit on the mechanics of that hip as it develops. So in those dogs, so we get a bit later, but we have them before there's a lot of degenerative changes, is we can do something called tripic, uh, triple pelvic um, osteotomy. Now in that surgery, we're actually making physical cuts in what we presume to be pretty well matured bone or bone that's mainly done its growth and, and change and physically tip the bone so that it entraps the head of those femurs. Okay, you get the same effect, but we're doing it with having to make some more advanced cutting. It's not a surgery that we would do unless a dog was really clinically uncomfortable in some way or showing us clinical signs of lameness. This isn't a dog who comes in for a pre-breeding evaluation, gets diagnosed with hip dysplasia, and goes to surgery. These are dogs that are bunny hopping. These are dogs that are showing weakness. These are dogs that are having a problem that we put through this procedure. We wouldn't elect, in most cases, to put a dog through who wasn't having some type of a clinical manifestation of hip uh, dysplasia. Now, what about the dogs we get really late? What about the dogs who've gone in because they're just having a sore hip and they're five or six years old? We go on through the evaluation, uh, sedate them for their procedure, find out we have Ortolani. That joint is subluxating. Find out that the x-rays show us we already have some of those behavioral changes of, that, of the bones of the joint. Well, here's a dog that's uncomfortable. And we know that we are not as inclined to be able to get success with some of those more juvenile procedures um, because of the arthritic changes that we may be already seeing. Well, in that case, Maybe triple pelvic osteotomy may help, but it's not going to take away the arthritic changes. Now we have to talk about a couple other surgeries to, uh, in these cases. So, we get, so when we get these older dogs, we have to consider, first off, is surgery what we have to do every time? No, of course not. I mean, just like us, when we have sore joints related to an injury we got, who knows when, we're going to try and manage it with supplements and medications. You know, a lot of times, anti-inflammatories, very important in management. Weight loss, an overweight dog is gonna have a much more profound um, problem with, with any joint issue. Hip dysplasia is not an exclusion from that. Glucosamines, uh, they're important for any joint protection. Um, Omega-3 fish oils, they can be anti-inflammatory. Very good as a supplement 
hopefully allow us to use less of our true anti-inflammatory when needed. And then of course, for some severe cases, we may need intermittent use of an opioid, some type of a, a more potent pain medication. But really designing a medical protocol uh, is something that in many times is sufficient to keep these guys comfortable and, and we can have good success. They're not going to be athletic dogs, but they can still enjoy pretty good quality of life. Now we know because there's movement, we have, are going to have progression of disease. And at some point we may have more disease than our medications are capable of controlling the pain that comes as a consequence of that. When that happens, we're reaching for a different set of surgical options. We know we have a hip, it's got degenerative change and may eventually start looking kind of like this. And we've got to find a solution for that. We know tipping the bone is not going to help. There's too much change there. Well, when that happens, we're talking about usually either what's called a femoral head and neck ostectomy, where we're physically removing the ball that's in the socket. And you get almost like an air ride. So this, uh, this joint will actually scar down without an actual joint here and we can get great function. Works in small and medium sized dogs and actually some large dogs. Giant breeds, we may not have as much success, but we can get surprising success in a lot of, a lot of dogs here. Um, and then of course, there's what you'll see in grandma and grandpa, total hip replacement. We have that in dogs as well. With that particular procedure, we're physically removing, again, the diseased joint, creating a new, a new bed for uh, an artificial joint. It's so quite an involved, often quite a costly surgery, but this can be an excellent option for, for a lot of our um, dogs for whom we're hoping to have a more athletic, um, or at least a somewhat athletic uh, outcome um, as they go forward. And of course, a very pain-free outcome once everything is healed. So as you can see, hip dysplasia can be pretty complicated. And it is something that's very important that you, you know, know what stage of life your pet is at, uh, you know what stage of secondary disease your pet is at, you need to know if they even have hip dysplasia or if they're just developing unrelated arthritic change to the hip. And you need to find out if surgery or medical therapy is the way to go. And oftentimes it's a combination of both. Um, and sometimes that, that combination comes to head as they go through the course of their lifetime. Starting medical, maybe ending up surgical. But this is very important that you establish um, what you can, know everything you can about your pet's hips. And hopefully you and your vet can start out a plan that's going to work. So if you have more questions about hip dysplasia, don't forget, we've got our comments box below. Happy to answer questions about it. Talk to you next time.